Two astronauts testing out Boeing's new Starliner spacecraft were supposed to begin making their way back to Earth by today, but instead they'll stay on the International Space Station due to technical problems. NASA did not provide a new date, raising questions about when the mission's two astronauts will return. Professor Anna Moore is director of the ANU's Institute for Space and joins us now live from Canberra. Good morning. Good to have you along. It's good to be here, Dan. Uh, Professor, tell me, what, what's your take on this? Because you'll be looking through a very different lens, I suspect, than the rest of us. Um, so, um, so the Starliner is a, a capsule that goes from Earth to the International Space Station, takes astronauts and cargo there, and then is to uh, return astronauts and whatever experiments back to Earth after then. And so um, this is the first time they've uh, tried to do this. So the, the launch was a little delayed, uh, but they eventually got there in mid-June. <clears throat> but it looks like there's some kind of issue with the, um, the propellant leak. And so uh, when a vehicle comes down to Worth, you do want to make sure you can maneuver it appropriately because it's coming in, has to come in at a certain angle, etc. And so if there is a little bit of an issue with that system, they're going to want to hold back, make sure they fully understand the extent of it before they, before they come back. And that's jury's out now as to what's happening there. Yeah, and one of the articles that I was reading, Professor, was that Sunita, Sunny Williams and Barry Butch Wilmore, who are both, I understand, test pilots uh, before this, uh, actually took control of it for some time. And so there'll be a whole lot of learning about how it operates and how to deal with d different circumstances in space when things go wrong. So there might be a, a silver lining if, if everything goes well. Well, that, that's true. I mean, it's, you know, it's rare that you get something working first time <laughs> <laughs> in space. It's a very, it's a really tough environment, you know, no vacuum, radiation, high radiation levels, uh, you know, the speed's eight kilometers a second. This is pretty, it's not usual, right? So, so there's a lot of effort goes into making sure these things work on the ground before they go up. And, you know, teething issues are something that's very common. It's normal. Um, but when you're talking about human lives, you really want to make sure you've got it right. So they're probably just being overcautious right now and making sure they can return those astronauts safely. And, and there were, uh, as you identified, some issues beforehand, which is, is sometimes the case. It was a year behind schedule and it blew out by $1.5 billion. Now that to me sounds like an eye-watering amount of money, but when you're talking about spacecraft, is this just what we have to expect as we get more and more technical and, and advanced in our technology that's going into space? Well, so um, when you're talking about human exploration, you, you're talking about a very small part of space. It just happened mm. when we talk about space, right? So it just happens to be the subject that gets the most attention. It's very inspirational, human space travel, etc. And so it should. But 99.9% .9 of the space economy is about services and data and how that helps us every day on the planet. So thinking about communications, how I'm talking to you today probably has a, a space angle to it, remote telehealth, adapting to climate change, navigation, um, earth observation, all that stuff is enabled by space and most of the future economy is all about that. So while we do concentrate on these flagship missions that you, you hear here and the, the prices associated with it, um, space to me is much more about how we help society on the ground. Yeah, well, while I've got you, there's a couple of other space-related matters I wanted to touch base with you about because we saw that, that China's lunar probe has returned mm -hmm. from the dark side of the moon, that China was the first, I believe, to, to visit that side of the moon in 2019. This has been a two-month mission and they've brought back two kilos of samples. What do you see as the significance of this particular mission? So, well, it says that China is at the forefront of especially cis, what's called cis-lunar, the space in between the Earth and the Moon. That kind of economy, the infrastructure you need to develop that kind of economy, if, if you bear with me, um, they're at the forefront of that. That's what this mission says to me. So the, and the dark side of the Moon is not actually dark <laughs> to uh, physically. I get, we call it that but just, just so, uh, because we can't see it. So the moon is tidally locked with the earth. It means we always see 
the front face of the moon. And what, what the probe was able to do was to leave from the Earth, navigate around the moon, land safely, be able to land in an area it was of interesting samples and things like this, probably a crater that didn't have solar illumination, <clears throat> maybe where water is, that kind of thing. It's been able to grab hold of that soil, safely take off, come back to Earth, launch in an area where it can be recovered, which I think was in the Mongolian desert, and then be able to be recovered without having any contamination of that sample, which is actually quite difficult. So these steps in themselves are all really tough. And, and the Chinese space community has, has come out and said, we're there. Yeah. Uh, look, just finally, before I let you go, Professor, can you give us a sense of uh, what's happening in the Australian space industry, an area that you and I have talked a lot about over the years, uh, and, and it seems every time we get an update is a little bit more exciting than the last? It is. So, you know, it's, it's going gangbusters. Um, and so we're, uh, we're talking about launch and return here at Australia. We've got, you know, startups that are transitioning. Uh, even at the ANU Institute for Space, which is a whole of university institute doing things from space law to advanced communications, we're going, you know, we're having to think about, well, actually, we need bigger stuff and bigger spaces and more people. So all that side of it is really cool. And it's a similar story around the country. Um, but I think what we do need is a, is a national space policy, uh, one that says to the outside world, this is actually what we care about here in Australia. This is our... This is why we want to invest in space for us, why we need to. Um, and touching on some of those climate change adaptability things would be really good.